Welcome to Engage, leading conversations that matter. Engage explores Central Florida's issues and culture with new voices, new perspectives, and thought-provoking interviews. Engage is made possible with the support of members like you and inaugural sponsor, JustCallMo.com. Engage is hosted by Sharon Stone. You are listening to Engage on 90.7 WMFE. I'm Sharon Stone. Coming up, we will talk with Congressman Michael Waltz about recent votes in the House and initiatives that impact Central Florida. And an area playwright is taking us to a musical about life before and after the Pulse nightclub tragedy, and he's taking it to New York. First, though, Buddy Dyer is the longest serving mayor in Orlando's history. He was first elected in 2003 and is in his final term. The head of the City Beautiful joins us now in studio. Thank you so much for your time, Mayor Sharon, Dyer. it's so good to be with you. It's been a long time since I've been out here. Yes, nice to have you in. And you're coming off a pretty huge weekend in Orlando, coming from what we had the NFL Pro Bowl, we had the Olympic Marathon Trials. How do you think everything went? So I don't often describe it this way, but it was an awesome weekend <laughs> in Orlando. It was an opportunity for us to showcase to the country, really to the world, um, how awesome Orlando is so we had um, the opening of Judson's, which is the new music venue in the Dr. Phillips Center on Friday night. We had the Olympic trials for the marathon, so the top three winner, top three runners in the men's and women's divisions were off to Paris, and we showcased the city in a wonderful manner. Great collaboration and partnership. Track Shack, uh, Go Sports. Um, we had fifteen hundred volunteers working. Wow. At that event, over 600 law enforcement agents, but it was a perfect day in Orlando. I got text messages from mayors all over the country saying, really? wow, you guys are doing a great job. And then we had the Pro Bowl, yes. uh, to, not to top it off, but on Sunday, and we were fortunate that the weather turned out to be better than expected. And um, that was another great showcase for the city of Orlando. So it was a really good weekend for the city and its residents. Mayor, is there any way to just measure the economic impact of all of that? Well, you can in terms of heads and beds and what the anticipated multiplier on uh, spending in restaurants and small businesses and things of that nature. So we estimate that the marathon was a $15 million impact and the Pro Bowl was about a $40 million (laughs) impact. And the Pro Bowl had... uh, Really good attendance. So the stadium holds 60, and we had about 56,000 for the Pro Bowl. And then uh, it's hard just to measure the uh, impact that we had on all the television sets that are turned on in the Northeast where they're snowed in and they're seeing 70 degrees in Orlando. It's kind of funny. The marathon runners thought it was hot at 74 degrees, um, but they had some really good times and uh, some good stories. Do you anticipate... Any other big events that you will be able to draw because of what you see as such a successful weekend? Well, we've become known as the premier sports destination in the country. So you think of all the great things that we've hosted from um, World Cups to WrestleMania to this was the fifth time we hosted the Pro Bowl. Uh, We're considered the U.S. men's soccer team's home city because they've played so many of their international matches here in Orlando, um, the friendlies that we've been able to host, the bowl games, we're the only city in the country that hosts three college bowl games during the month of December and January. We usually have some type of kickoff classic. We have uh, the Florida, Florida A&M Bethune-Cookman game in November. So we can host just about anything the world can bring to us in terms of sports with the uh, what Disney's Wild World of Sports and then the USTA facility and then all of the venues, and including the convention center that hosts these giant volleyball tournaments. So we are a great sports town, a great sports destination. I wanted to start with just all the great things that happened this weekend, but unfortunately there were some things that happened the last couple of days that aren't as positive, but I want to ask you about them. One of them, the city had to fix the Pulse nightclub sign after vandalism there. You just, the city of Orlando just bought the site a few months ago. Are you thinking about making any changes there, maybe adding security now? They had not had security. We didn't feel it was necessary. This was a random act. It wasn't a targeted act. The perpetrator um, hit 
a number of different businesses just along that way. So it wasn't somebody that was looking pers- purposefully to um, tag Target. Pulse per se. But we are looking at whether we should go ahead and put some cameras in and have some different security measures for the temporary memorial there. Are you able to update us on where you are with coming up with a permanent memorial? So we, uh, in December, purchased the property from the One Pulse Foundation, who've been working to bring a memorial forth for seven years, and it just didn't work out. And we felt it was necessary that the city engage and um, take the project over and get it done. But we wanted to take a step back, make sure we understood everything that had gone on during the course of those seven years, and then to re-engage with the families and the victims and survivors and make sure that there was a community process in place, that everybody felt like they had some input onto what we were going to do there. And I think the mistake that One Pulse made was focusing on a museum as well as the memorial. We will be focused strictly on creating the memorial. This happened in 2016. Is that is that frustrating for you that we're just now... Doing this. It is, but we are, we are where we are. We don't need to look back and blame yep. anybody. We're just going to move forward and get this done, but do it in a way that's methodical and that everybody that wants to have input has an opportunity to have some input. Something else I wanted to ask you about, just yesterday there was that fire at the Coalition for the Homeless Men's Shelter in Orlando. No one was hurt, but now we've got this scramble going on to find housing for 237 residents that were forced out. And additionally, the kitchen that was used for the neighboring Center for Women and Families was damaged in that same fire. Can you share an update or any new information about the residents? I can a little bit. Um, Certainly, the bad news is that the fire occurred and there was substantial water damage from the sprinklers going off was was the bigger impact. But again, it's our community rallying to support those in need. Um, The 230-some-odd, 250-some-odd uh, individuals got housed in a church in Winter Park and at the rescue mission um, and at the Salvation Army last night, Shiloh Baptist is stepping up right there in Paramore a few blocks away and has offered to house up to 250 uh, of the men over the course of the next week or so. Okay. And everybody's stepping up to support them. So links with buses last night, lots of volunteers. So, you know, the The silver lining out of that was how our community responds to events of that sort and really uh, pitches in and helps everybody out. And I think this leads us to just a bigger conversation about the unhoused in Orlando. Um, Last May, Homeless Services Network of Central Florida found a 38 percent increase in the previous year in the number of homeless people found to be living without shelter. So that's a significant jump. What is the city of Orlando doing to combat homelessness? So... One of the few bright spots out of COVID was we um, received, the city of Orlando received $58 million in American Rescue Plan money. And that was sent on a uh, formula-based measure to cities around the country. And there were very few strings on how you would use whatever money you were allocated. A lot of cities had to use it to plug gaps in their budgets because of what had occurred during COVID. We didn't need to do that. Um, We had been very fiscally prudent. We were free to use $58 million for where we thought the biggest need was, and that was in the area of affordable housing and homelessness. So we used all $58 million for a program we're calling Accelerate Orlando, acknowledging that we've been working on the issue of homelessness and affordable housing, but that we could accelerate it by investing this $58 million to improve the facilities at the... Um, Salvation Army, the Coalition for the Homeless, um, the um, Ambassador Hotel. We helped a a developer purchase and renovate into affordable apartments, which um, is what we're trying to do in a number of different areas. And then the probably the biggest piece is the Christian Service Center. We invested an additional $6 million so that they could – uh, operate as a day facility, offering hygiene, showers, uh, people being able to wash their clothes, but more importantly, as an intake for job training and job placement. 
So it's the first true day facility of its type that we have in Central Florida. We hope that other communities, other cities and counties might emulate that. Um, But there is a higher number of those that are unhoused, and it's largely due to the pressure in the housing area. So there's a deficit in affordable housing. Quite honestly, there's a deficit in housing at every level that you can think of, or there was the housing that a young couple that bought a $250,000 starter home and were thinking of moving up to that $500,000 home that now costs Seven hundred fifty thousand or a million because yeah. of the pressure. So, um, the uh, housing issues have not gone away, um, and we continue to have population growth to the tune of a thousand to fifteen hundred people every week. So we need we have a, a dire need for additional housing in our market. What do you say to those people who are dealing with these soaring rent or mortgage prices and say, I love it here, but I just can't afford to live here? Um, Say it's a reality. We're working on it um, and doing the best we can, but it's going to take a while to catch up with the percentage of how are the deficit in housing that we have. Much more with Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer coming up. And later on Engage, we will hear from Congressman Michael Waltz on recent votes in the U.S. House. I'm Sharon Stone. You are listening to Engage. You're listening to Engage on 90.7 WMFE. I'm Sharon Stone. If you missed part of today's show, it will be available on demand at WMFE.org. Ahead on this program, an Orlando man captured the tragedy of Pulse nightclub and the unity of Orlando's LGBTQ plus community in a musical. The city really came together in a way that many of us had never seen. It feels like now the show's purpose is to help remember those moments. We will talk with playwright Donald Roop about taking From Here off Broadway. First, though, let's continue our conversation with Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer. And let's start by talking about an event that you're attending tonight, Harbor House of Central Florida's annual Walk a Mile in Her Shoes that is at the Orange County Courthouse. Will you tell us about the event and why it is so important to you? So this is uh, Harbor House is our domestic violence shelter. And um, unfortunately, they had more calls and need for services this year than they did last year. And same thing the year before that. So... The issue continues to increase, but the good news is we're talking about it. So the idea is that men need to walk a mile in the shoes of women. And I've been a part of this event for a long time. I used to wear uh, very high heel red shoes and okay. have found that um, that doesn't work for me very well. And quite honestly, the um, standing around is worse than the actual walking is. But the idea is that feeling that pain just on a short basis um, is symbolic of the pain that people that are victims of domestic violence feel. And we know that domestic violence is all around us. We may not see it, but we need to try to be aware of it and not just um, slip it under the rug. Um, We need to be able to converse about that and try to recognize the symptoms of that. And then to support Harbor House, which is a really quality service provider in that area. And that's tonight. You'll be joined by some other just big leaders in our community as well, the police chief. There's generally a good turnout, and uh, you'll see all types of shoes. I have gone from the red high heels to some high heel boots to now I have uh, golden tennis shoes that work a little bit better for me. That works. (laughs) Let's talk about something else that you've been working on. I know it's been important to you. Just these innovation hubs that we're seeing in Orlando. I'm talking about the Medical City in Lake Nona, Creative Village downtown, EA, Electronic Arts Studio. Is this enticing some other types of company, maybe big tech companies, to consider expanding or even moving to Orlando? It absolutely does. So you can call them hubs or you can call them clusters. And we have great experiences in industry clusters, industry hubs. The best known, of course, is our uh, theme park clusters, um, which are 
the greatest in the world, but we have the biggest cluster or innovation hub of modeling, simulation, and training mm -hmm. companies that are housed um, in large part in the um, in the uh, Science Village out at um, or the Research Park out at UCF. Mm -hmm. But we have Lake Medical, the Medi our Lake Nona, the Medical City, and of course Creative Village in our downtown, which is a industry cluster in digital media. So EA's uh, Eastern headquarters are there as an anchor. But probably the most important part of that, almost all of the clusters or innovation hubs are also um, supported by academia. So okay. training students, training people to have jobs in the industries that um, we're supporting. So the Creative Village is no different than that. We have um, the Florida Entertainment Interactive Entertainment Academy in the Creative Village, which is a uh, the best year in year out, very best postgraduate program for video gamers. So not poker players, but people that make games like EA Sports does. And um, when you have anchors like that, that attracts other companies to those clusters. Listening to you talk about all this expansion is making me wonder, what do we do about transit and transportation then? So you know that um, we finished the I-4 construction. We finished the first 61 miles of SunRail later this year. And our goal is to expand SunRail to the airport mm -hmm. and SunRail to iDrive. Certainly we have Brightline now coming between M Miami and the Orlando International Airport. The county is discussing a one-cent sales tax for transportation. Um, That'll either come to fruition or not in the next couple of months. And if it does come to fruition, as voted on by the county, mm -hmm. that will be voted on by referendum in November by the um, residents of Orange County and is a much needed revenue source to help us expand transit. That's um, roughly $600 million a year in money for transportation. And the, the nice thing about a sales tax um, of that sort is more than 50% of that would be played by tourists, so not people that actually live in Orlando. Now, I will concede that part of our transportation issues is generated by the fact that we're fortunate enough to have 75 million people that visit Central Florida, visit Orange County every single year. So um, that's a big impact on our economy, but it's also a big impact on our transportation infrastructure. We're talking with Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer. You announced that this is your final term. You sure? I'm pretty sure about that. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've been, I was in the Senate for 10 years, and I've been mayor since 2003, and I love every day of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'll be 68 at the end of this term and have 25 good years in. But I like to say, you know, I'd only been in City Hall one time. When I was elected in 2003. So now I finally got good experience. I can get everybody a really good four years as mayor with the experience I've had for the last 21 years. Plenty of experience to get to this point for sure. Any um, big goals you can tell us in your last oh, few years? Oh, still a ton of them. We've talked about a lot of them, which are issues of affordable housing um, and the homelessness, getting the Pulse Memorial, which was not one I was counting on mm -hmm. six months ago, but is an important one. Uh, the renovation, our continuing renovation to Camping World Stadium, um, additional uh, renovation to the Kia. See, I said Kia, not the Amway Center. Um, and, and then the SunRail aspect, getting to uh, the airport and to iDrive. That one, if I can just get a groundbreaking done, I know it won't be completed in four years, but those are some things. Phase two of Creative Village we've talked a little about. I mean, we've talked about everything that's kind of on the agenda. There's just lots of fun stuff to do. This is kind of a big question, but have you been reminiscing at all in your time, maybe some favorite memories, accomplishments? You, you know, just a, a little bit in the sense of not necessarily going back and reminiscing, okay. but thinking like on election night, this is the last yeah. one of them, or when I was sworn in, this is the last time I'll be sworn in as mayor. So there's a, a lot of things that as we go through them, I'll realize, okay, this is the last time I'm going to do this. But I've got, well, let's see, this is February, so I'm one month in. i got 47 months left, so uh, plenty of time to do uh, a lot of good stuff. 
No, I say, sorry, I save this to the end when we have four minutes because you told me in the beginning you could spend the entire time talking about this. But you have a new role to add to your title, first-time grandfather. First-time grandfather. So many people don't know, but my real name is John, John Hugh Dyer, Jr., so my son is named John Hugh Dyer the third, and we now have John Hugh Dyer the fourth, and he is uh, his nickname is Forrest. None of us have ever used John as a name, but For Forrest. Okay. Forrest. Forrest. <laughs> and he was born in August, and he is just a happy child. Um, Trey and Hannah are great parents, and it's great to be a grandfather. My name is G Buddy. Okay. Grand buddy was too much, we thought. That and works. He'll probably choose whatever he's going to choose to call me, but that's what we're hoping for. And it's just, you know, it, it, it gives you a little different perspective when you bring um, another life into existence that's part of your family and going to be a continuation of your family. And then the joy that a small child like that just brings into everybody's life. Did that factor into your decision to make this your last term? No, not ne okay. not necessarily. Um, they live here. I, if they lived somewhere else where we were trying to go visit them, but mm -hmm. they live here in Orlando, so um, it's not like I can't see them pretty much every other day anyway, so that, that definitely was not a factor. Just I think at some point giving somebody else uh, an opportunity to uh, lead our city is appropriate. And you said that it, it changes you. Just how has it or it's impacted you. How has this changed you, being a grandfather? Um, it, it just makes you reflect. I, I guess in one way, I, to tie it to, to being mayor, is decisions being made that you know will affect your grandchild when he grows up. And making sure that we're making those decisions that makes Orlando continue to be a great place to live and grow up 20 years from now. So some of those transportation decisions or some of those land use decisions that are 20 and 30 year, even 50 year decisions versus some of the decisions I make are, you know, impact today and tomorrow. Yeah. But a lot of the decisions impact 10 years from now, 20 years from now, or 30 years from now. And before we let you go, Mayor Dyer, is there, just with our audience in Central Florida, anything that you would like to tell them now as you're in your final term? Uh, I enjoy, I have enjoyed, and I do enjoy every single day as being mayor of this great city, and it is largely because of the people. Um, we have disarray in our country. We have partisan differences. We have rural versus city differences, uh, a lot going on. But I feel like Orlando, we continue to be united. We continue to embrace diversity in our community, and we're a little bit different than um, most of the country is right now, and we're going to strive every day to keep it that way. Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer, thank you so much for your time, and I hope you come back. I will. I thank, thank you, Sharon. You. Yesterday, we spoke with U.S. Representative Michael Waltz. The Jacksonville native is in his third term as a House Republican, representing the southern suburbs of Jacksonville to New Smyrna Beach, including Daytona Beach. Now, Waltz was elected into the seat that was vacated by current Governor Ron DeSantis in 2018. The former Green Beret has focused on foreign policy, sitting on both the House's Armed Services and Foreign Affairs Committees. And we spoke with him less than 24 hours after House Republicans attempted an impeachment vote to remove Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Now, that vote failed when three Republican congressmen voted against impeachment. A few minutes after the vote, a Republican-led emergency bill for military aid for Israel failed. We spoke to Representative Waltz, who was in Washington via Zoom. And we started the conversation by asking how impeaching Secretary Mayorkas would change conditions at the border. Well, look, I think it would send a, a very clear signal uh, and one that needs to be sent uh, that Congress constitutionally has the authority to to craft and and pass our laws, and we just can't have uh, cabinet officials blatantly ignoring uh, those laws, but not only ignoring them, then repeatedly coming to uh, the Congress and obviously through us to the American people and lying about it. Uh, and you know we can go uh, chapter and verse 
on how that has happened. I think it's most obvious on on uh, Secretary Mayorkas repeatedly testifying to the Congress under oath that the border was secure, uh, is secure, how it was secure. And yet anybody with any um, any common sense would tell you they look at DHS's own data and, the, and CBP's data, much of which actually is is frankly leaked to us uh, by very frustrated Border Patrol agents not provided through official channels that we've repeatedly asked for on uh, the millions of people unvetted uh, that are are flowing over our border. And just don't take it from me. I mean, I think that one of the things that is so heartbreaking about it, Doctors Without Borders and other NGOs have repeatedly testified that 40% of the girls and women uh, in the millions that are being trafficked across are sexually assaulted, raped, and sold into human trafficking. So there's a humanitarian aspect of it that is heartbreaking. But then you'll have on the heels of Mayorkas's repeated testimonies, uh, the FBI director coming around and saying, look, we've gone from 11 under the previous administration, people on the terrorist watch list, to now over 300 uh, that are somewhere in our interior. The FBI is diverting massive amounts of assets to try to track them down. And, you know, just case in point, in the Pulse nightclub shooting, uh, the, the shooter was on the terrorist watch list. And I don't think it's responsible for us to wait uh, until we have some type of attack to continue to let uh, the the scale of the humanitarian crisis that is the southern border continue. Um, and uh, you know, look, constitutionally, um, that is a that is a decision that that our committee marked up. Uh, I think we're going to have another vote on it. And ultimately, we will impeach uh, Secretary Mayorkas. So you will be moving forward with another vote to impeach? Well, I don't want to definitively speak for for our leadership, but that's my understanding of their intent. Were you surprised that he was not impeached this week? Look, I was surprised by uh, by. I don't want to say surprised. I mean, look, they made their their concerns clear. Our Republican no votes. Uh, they were, uh, um, you know, they were concerned, and we had a lot of debate about the. I mean, literally in our conference, we're going into the kind of back to the founding fathers, to the Federalist paper. There was a debate over the term misdemeanor, high crimes and misdemeanor, what the founders intent meant, you know, in the 18th century. We have members, as they should, that take the constitutional constitution incredibly seriously. Uh, no one disputed the humanitarian and national security crisis uh, that our southern border is. Um, but there was uh, some concern voiced about um, about the constant, you know, about the precedent that that we could be setting. The Democratic controlled Senate has pretty much squashed this impeachment from moving forward. So help me understand what's the path forward with any kind of policy change, knowing that he won't be convicted of impeachment? Well, I don't think we can. It, it, I don't think we can get into the business, whether it's this uh, or um, fiscal responsibility and cuts to the out of control federal budget or or uh, defense spending, what have you. I don't think we can get in the business of negotiating against ourselves um, on what we think the Senate may or may not do. I mean, for example, we passed uh, a border security bill, H.R. 2, nine months ago. It's been sitting uh, at the foot of the, the Senate, and that's for the Senate to decide and take up. We passed uh, an Israel security uh, bill with pay fors uh, from the IRS several months ago. It still hasn't been taken up by the Senate. So I think we have to just focus on what we see are the right policies for the country. Uh, and if the Senate decides to ignore them, not take them up, let the problems fester and continue, then I think that'll be the for the you know, for us to make that case to the voters uh, come this November. You mentioned Israel. On Tuesday, the House mm. did not pass that separate standalone $17 billion aid package for Israel. Why didn't that pass? Well, uh, I mean, not to get into parliamentary procedure, it, it certainly passed with a majority, uh, a vast majority. I, think, I, I want to say over 250 votes. Um, but procedurally, it needed two thirds 
uh, because of some, you know, some of our some of our rules on that type of bill, uh, or the fact it was called under suspension, uh, a suspension of some of the rules. Uh, I think that number will increase. There are concerns um, about pay fors. There's concerns about our debt. Uh, I share those concerns. But right now, uh, Israel is under an existential threat. Uh, they literally, we could see them over, overrun. Uh, and when we have a terrorist organization, multiple terrorist organizations on their border, uh, both Hezbollah and Hamas, uh, that are well-funded by Iran, that have the capability to annihilate Israel with over 150,000 rockets, many of them GPS-guided, that could hit nuclear plants, that could hit their port, that could hit their international airport. Uh, if Iran gives the green light, uh, I, I think this is of such uh, an existential threat to our greatest ally in the Middle East. I was certainly willing to vote for it, but there are those uh, that wanted to go back to our pay for um, uh, bill that we passed, you know, several months ago. So we'll continue to work that that out uh, in in the coming weeks. But I, I think we absolutely just have to stand by uh, our ally in, in its time of of need. Given the urgency that you just described there with Israel, mm -hmm. what do you think the best next step is for lawmakers? Well, uh, going forward, I think we need to have to continue to have those conversations. If we want, I, I think we need to continue to put pressure on the Senate. If they didn't like uh, reducing the number of IRS agents uh, to pay for aid to our greatest ally, then come back with a different pay for. Uh, we still have unspent COVID money. Uh, we have money that's going to take years in the Green New Deal provisions of the of the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, but essentially sitting on it for for political reasons, I think, is is frankly, it's, it's just incredibly unfortunate. So let, let's find a way. We'll continue to work for the we'll continue to work with the Senate. I think we should put all the pressure that we can on the Senate uh, to send that bill back with a different pay for. Um, we, we've tried to get it clean. We've tried to get it paid for. I think the Democrat Party is incredibly split on this issue. Uh, and they're, they're uh, frankly, I think, acceding to a lot of pressure from the progressive left on this. Um, but at the end of the day, we cannot have uh, the only democracy in the Middle East, a representative democracy, uh, that, uh, that, you know, get overrun, get annihilated, continue to get hammered uh, by uh, terrorist organizations all backed by Iran. Some other issues I want to discuss while we have you. Just Wednesday, you introduced this bipartisan Protecting the Families of Our Fallen Patriots Act in the House. For those of us who have not heard of that, talk to us about how that is supposed to benefit our Gold Star families. Yeah, I mean, look, this is very near and dear and personal to me. I lost Green Berets in combat, and I saw that, you know, one— once their loved ones were were put in the ground at Arlington National Cemetery or elsewhere, we do not do the job that we should to continue to care uh, for those families. Um, uh, case in point, one of the things that we corrected uh, was that the Defense Department only flew the remains to one location. I had a family that uh, that. Their parents wanted to celebrate the fallen Green Beret in one location, but then they tried to hand the bill to the spouse to then fly him to a national cemetery. We got that corrected. We got that fixed. Uh, in this case, uh, if the spouse starts earning too much, uh, they hit some caps that uh, they start losing their Social Security survivor's benefits, uh, which to me, uh, you know, <laughs> we, we need to allow these spouses to move on. Of course, they want to further their careers and make a good living uh, as they as they work through their grief and move forward. And the last thing we should do is be penalizing them uh, financially for move, moving forward. So this bill would would seek to keep those benefits in place uh, and which they have earned through the greatest sacrifice, giving, you know, giving your loved one in, in the service of this country uh, and continue to earn a living. Any sense of a timeline how this might move forward? Well, we'll look to we've introduced it. It's bipartisan uh, and we'll look to and 
include this as a measure in the next defense bill. Another issue I want to ask you about is quite street level. Just can you update us on the flooding mitigation efforts that you've been working on for Daytona Beach and our coastline? Yeah, no, thanks for asking. I mean, this is something that we've literally worked on for years. Uh, Some of the poorest uh, and um, largely African-American neighborhoods in Daytona we're extremely flood prone, not just when we have a hurricane, but we have, you know, in Florida, we have a heavy rain at four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so much so that some of the older residents would tell us stories of literally their homes being flooded out. And one woman told us how she she put her infant up in the cabinet while she ran out trying to find her toddlers. Uh, this flood mitigation program, uh, which will largely be funded by the Corps of Engineers, uh, so it'll be a federal program. We'll, we'll fund uh, the design for various types of retention ponds, water runoff, resiliency efforts uh, to, to get that corrected. And this has been an issue literally going back generations. Uh, so incredibly proud to get the, the $3 million for the design of it. Uh, normally, it's spread out over three years. We got it all front loaded into one year. Uh, and the the, the great thing about these programs, once the Corps of Engineers takes them on, is they fund the sustainment and the repair uh, for the next 30 to 50 years. Uh, all of this was done uh, without uh, the local and state government having to kind of come up with their share, so to speak. So this will be largely federally funded. And the mayor of Daytona Uh, When I announced this to the city council, said this was the most significant thing to come through the council in his time as mayor. So just there's a team effort at the state and local level to to get it done, but but proud to to get this project started. Well, I have you, Congressman. Your term ends January 2025. You thinking about a run for governor? Well, first, we need to get reelected. And I am running for reelection as a member of Congress. And then we'll, you know, look, we'll see past there. Uh, It's it's an honor to be considered. Uh, It would be an honor to um, uh, to lead the great state of Florida and what I would call Florida 3.0. I think uh, Governor Scott has done an amazing job. Governor DeSantis has done a job. A thousand people a day are voting with their feet to move here. Uh, We need to manage that growth responsibly. We're taking a look at it. And I'll just leave it at there. Right now, I'm running for re-election uh, to, to represent my district in Congress. And that was U.S. Congressman Mike Waltz. Just hours after this interview, a bipartisan bill to control security at the southern border and address the immigration crisis failed when Republicans, including Congressman Waltz, voted against it. That bill contained provisions demanded by Republican lawmakers. Coming up, hear from the playwright behind the musical about life before and after the Pulse tragedy. You are listening to Engage. You're listening to Engage on 90.7 WMFE. I'm Sharon Stone. The June 2016 shooting at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando left 49 people dead, more than 50 injured, and an untold number of members of the region's LGBTQ plus community grieving and looking for some type of peace. Donald Roop found solace in the theater. He is a co-founder and the artistic director of the Renaissance Theater Company in Orlando and the playwright behind From Here. That play depicts the lives and relationships within Orlando's LGBTQ plus community prior to and in the aftermath of the Pulse tragedy. From here is playing a limited run in Orlando from late March through early May. Then the whole cast and crew is off to New York for an off-Broadway showing in late May. Roop joined us to talk about From Here. The show really centers on how that moment really shaped and changed so many people in Orlando in those days and weeks following and how we kind of left that moment with a different perspective of the city in which we live, but also in the way that we feel towards one another 
and the appreciation that we have for our chosen families and for our friends and loved ones. This show is about love in the face of adversity. It's about a city overcoming tragedy and, and, and experiencing and moving through tragedy. And it's about memorializing something that should have never happened. Did creating this help you channel that change that you mentioned? Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting because when when we first did this show, I don't I don't think we understood what it was. It was very much very very much like how the murals popped up all over the city and other many people were creating art right away. And that's something we talk about in the show and um from here is certainly not the first or the only theatrical event that has discussed what Pulse meant to the artist. And I think like so many others, I remember I saw I saw original choir piece. I saw an original orchestration that an orchestra played in tribute to Pulse. I've seen four or five other theatrical presentations that that deal with the artist's own perspectives. We've had books written now, we've had papers written. And so I feel like that desire to as an artist to respond and to work through was something that I didn't even realize I was experiencing at the time. I just felt so drawn to tell what I could see was such an important moment for Orlando, but also very personally for me. From what I saw, it was very emotional from the audience and the performers. Who are those people that are performing? Yeah, it's been so important for us th throughout the show's journey. And the show is not new. It premiered first in 2019, and, and we've done it several times in Orlando and once in New York City. And throughout this journey, it's been so important that there are people, the people in the show and involved in working on the show have that authentic connection to Orlando and, and to Pulse and or safe spaces like Pulse. Um, and of course, when I use the word safe space, I mean like the definition, the, defini the, the definition that is like an inclusive space where people feel okay to express their identity. So we've always cast and included people who were here in, during that time. Many of the performers, you know, I'm a, I'm an artist, so my friends who are my family are also performers. So many of the performers are the people who lived those days with me and 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 with our with our city um certainly everybody remembers those moments is it difficult for you and the performers to do this it's it's been really i mean the short answer is of course it it has been an interesting um at times very difficult um story to tell because so much of it is based in reality, especially the portion of the show that deals with Pulse. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I always hesitate to talk about my, the, my, my friends and the people in my circle who were there at Pulse, who survived or who lost loved ones. Um, but certainly the, it's it was the first difficult step was you know the first time they came to see the show and seeing um seeing their response and and honestly hearing their support was a, like a an interesting um you know we talk about these people in real life when we're talking about the memories at pulse we're mentioning the people who we love who work there and we were mentioning the the performers who we who i grew up watching and so seeing those performers then watch this show where they're they're mentioned um seeing the the employees and bartenders and the people who we talk about has been that was a, the first kind of difficult moment and what's interesting is over time, the, it feels like the function or the, the purpose of the show has evolved. Awesome. And we've noticed, it, we've noticed it every time we've done it. Um, each year, as we get a little further from what happened, the purpose changes in, in that. It now feels like when we get to that section where we're remembering those weeks after Pulse and like the, the vigils, like the Lake Eola vigil and talking about um, how the city really came together in a way that many of us had never seen. 
it feels like now the show's purpose is to help remember those moments and to help remind us all like, hey, we went through this. It's it's really important that we never forget and that we try to make sure that we're creating a place where something like that can never happen again. And then when we think about bringing the show to New York City, it's similar in that it almost feels like it has a function in, at times of like a documentary type story. Certain, because people all over the world were um, watching Orlando in those days. Is there meaning to the title from here? The title was 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 challenging for this, but um, it it has several meanings. Um, the opening song is "Where Do I Go From Here," and then also there's an ongoing theme of in in those days following Pulse. Suddenly, it felt like we were all from here, so it kind of has a dual meaning. And then in one of the versions of the show, those that was the last line: "No matter where I go from here." this will always be with me. So the, the title has a lot of different meanings. And I'm from here, so that that's part of it. So Donna, we've talked about how the actual shooting really is not the major part of the show, but I'm curious, what do you say to people who just hear Pulse Nightclub and just automatically shut this down? Like, nope, not watching it. Yeah, it, it's definitely a sensitive topic. And I'll be honest with you, we haven't had much of that um until very recently and sometimes people will read a headline and not go further than the headline and make a, make assumptions and <laughs> my first response is always like i completely agree with you if you're if you're imagining that somebody is creating some sort of fluffy musical about this horrible thing that happened i i would I would be appalled as well. And um, we would certainly never do that. My, I, so my response is always, I try to tell people what the show is really about. It's really about a chosen family. And there's a section where they they learn of the pulse shooting and, and they're responding to it. And sometimes people will ask, well, why isn't there a character that was really at the shooting? And my answer is like, I, I would never do that. I would never attempt to tell that perspective because I don't that's not my perspective to tell. And so we've been very um, respectful and cautious to not go anywhere near that story because that's not that's not our story to tell and that's in my opinion not a story that should be told in this in this kind of art form. Donald Roop is the playwright behind From Here. That is all for today's edition of Engage. Join us Tuesday when we talk with Florida State Attorney Andrew Bain about cultivating relationships between communities and police. Engage is available on demand on our website, wmfe.org.